He has gone from a superficial faith to a strong faith. He hears the Word of God. He believes the Word of God. He obeys the Word of God. He rests in the Word of God. And if you don't learn how to do that, you listen to your pastor now, you're going to be blown about. You're going to be stampeded by all kinds of things. You get a bulldog grip on the Word of God and don't be trying to live by emotions and feelings and visions and dreams, signs and wonders. For over 50 years, pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers preached to audiences and touched lives all over the world with his unique brand of solid biblical teaching. His teaching has been described as profound truth stated so simply a five-year-old can understand it, and yet it still touches the heart of a 50-year-old. And you'll hear that in these messages on the basics of the Christian faith. Have your Bibles ready and join us for today's message. Before we begin, remember, you can follow along with Pastor Roger's outline and notes on today's message at lwf.org or the MyLWF app. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Would you take God's Word and turn, please, to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John. And I want to speak to you today about faith, having strong faith. Now, in our economy, the dollar is the medium of exchange. But in the kingdom of heaven, faith is the medium of exchange. The Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. Whatever we receive uh, from God is according to our faith not according to our friends, not according to our family, not according to our fortune, not according to our feelings, not according to our fate, F-A-T-E. I hope you're not watching the horoscope. But according to our faith, according to your faith, be it unto you. Not only do we need uh, <laughs> to possess a faith, what we need is for faith to possess us. We need a mighty faith because we have a mighty God. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions, who believes? Faith answers, I, I believe. But you know, we need a strong faith, not a weak faith, but a strong faith. Now I'm going to share with you from the Word of God a story about a man who came to Jesus, and this man had a weak faith. I would call it a superficial faith, even worse, a, a superstitious faith. But he went from that uh, superstitious faith to a strong faith to a saving faith. And that's what I want us to see today, and I hope that you today will grow in faith. Now, this man, uh, the story we're going to read about, was a nobleman. That is, he had much to uh, commend him. He had many resources at his hand, but he had a problem. And you know, many of us, no matter what we have in our bank accounts and what we have on our... Uh, biographical sketch, we have problems that only God can solve. This man had a, a problem that was a son that was sick. And this nobleman wanted Jesus to heal his son. And the dark soil of that problem was the soil in which the seed of faith would grow. Now, do you want a strong faith? Do you really? Would you like to really believe God and please God. You know, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. No matter what else you do, I don't care how beautifully you sing this morning, how sacrificially you give, how uh, circumspectly you walk, how faithfully you serve. If you're not believing God, you're not pleasing God. Without faith it is impossible to please God. And the greater your faith, the greater glory God gets, the more pleased he is with it. And by, by faith man gives God pleasure, and by faith, God gives man treasure, real treasure. So, let's see here something about a strong faith. Begin reading with me in, in um, uh, verse 46. Chapter 4, verse 46. So, Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. 
When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he, that is the son, was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now Jesus was not giving that just simply as a statement of fact. He was giving that as a rebuke to this man. Jesus is rebuking this man who was looking for signs and wonders. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word. Now, if you don't mind marking your Bible, would you underscore that? Would you underscore that? And the man believed the word. Now, what we have here is in opposition, signs and wonders and the word. That's what we have. Uh, first, Jesus rebukes him. Except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. And then Jesus speaks to him, and there's a transformation. And now it says, and the man believed the word. What you have on the one side are wonders, and what you have on the other side is the Word. Now, that's very key, so I hope you'll keep your heart and mind on that. And the man believed the Word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And when he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday. <laughs> That's very interesting too. Mark it right now. Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. That's probably, uh, according to their time, about 1 p.m. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Well, I thought he'd already believed. Now it mentions he believes again. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, are you ready to have a strong faith? Would you really like to have a strong faith? Would you like to be able to believe God and lay believing hands on the promises of God? Well, let me lay three things on your heart this morning. First of all, what I want to call the problem of a superstitious faith, or if you rather, problem of a superficial faith. It makes no difference how you say it. Uh, at first, when this man first met Jesus, his faith was almost non-existent. Look again in verse 48. Go back and look at it. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. This man had a faith that was based on signs and wonders. Evidently, his motto was, Seeing is believing. God, if you just give me a sign, if you just give me a wonder, then I can believe. And what had happened to this man, therefore, is he is dependent upon his five senses. He's not dependent upon the Word of God. Now, doubtless, uh, this man had uh, heard that Jesus had turned water into wine. Look, if you will, in verse 46. It's not put there just by happenstance. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, Jesus had done a miracle. The first miracle that Jesus performed was turning water into wine. This man had heard about this, and he was taken with this, and so he, he was kind of, as we would say in the vernacular today, he was blown away by this miracle. Here was somebody who could turn water into wine. But Jesus knew that miracles, signs and wonders, are really very little good in strong faith. Now, you may not believe that. If you're like I am, when you were a younger Christian, you were saying, oh, God, I just want to see a miracle. You ever, you ever been, I, I want to see a, a miracle. I mean a, a, a genuine industrial strength miracle. I mean one that cannot be explained any other way except that you supernaturally do something. I, I'm ashamed to admit it, but when I was in college, I got in the room one time and prayed and asked God to move a chair from one side to the other. I'm so glad the devil didn't nudge that chair. <laughs> but I wanted to see, and I was just saying, now, Lord, I, I want to see something that, you know, that I can say I have seen, I felt, I have experienced a miracle. How many of you have kind of been that way sometime? Let me see your hand. Be honest. Come on now. I've already confessed. I, I mean, we, we want a sign. We want a wonder. We want a miracle. And this man had heard about Jesus turning water into wine. 
And so he's coming now to Jesus. He's come all the way from Capernaum, about 17 miles away, and he's saying, now, come down and heal my son. Anybody can turn water into wine can heal my son. And Jesus rebukes him. Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. That, that was the same way that they were when Jesus turned water into wine. Now you're in chapter uh, 4. Be easy for you. Just turn back two chapters to chapter 2 and look at it. Look at it. Chapter 2, verse 23. And when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. Well, you say, isn't that good? They believed in Jesus when they saw the miracles that he did. But notice verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. And the word commit and the word believe in the, same, in the Greek are the same word. They believed in Jesus, but he didn't believe in them. That it was a superficial faith. And notice how, what it goes on to say. Uh, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew that these people were following him. They were, quote, believing on him because of the miracle. They didn't have strong faith. They had superficial faith almost superstitious faith. And uh, we, he, this man in, in uh, John chapter 4 has plenty of brothers in the 20th century today. You would be amazed how many people today want signs and wonders. They want visions. They want emotions. They want dreams. They want liver shivers and icicles going up and down the spine and angels playing tic-tac-toe on the ribs. They want something so they can say, hey, I know, I know it is real. Now I have seen, now I have touched, now I have smelled, now I have heard, and now I know it is real. Oh God, give me a sign. Oh God, give me a wonder. And I want to tell you that the world is full of people just like that, and many of them sit in our churches today. It is amazing uh, what some people will believe. In December 1996, in my home state of Florida, something happened. Uh, uh, there was a customer in the Seminole Finance Corporation looked out the window across the street uh, to a, a car sales place, a place called uh, Ugly Duckling Car Sales. And uh, this person saw on the, on the window of the Ugly Duckling Car Sales a picture of what appeared to be the Virgin Mary, just somehow in the glass, just different colors in the, in the glass, in the sunlight. Just, it wasn't painted on there or anything, but she just saw what appeared to be uh, an image of the Virgin Mary. Well, she went out and said, look, I have seen a miracle. I've seen the Virgin Mary on the window pane of the ugly duckling car sales. Well, would you realize, or do you understand that folks down there in Florida it was near Christmas time. They had a traffic jam of nearly 60,000 people coming to see the Virgin Mary on a window pane. And uh, some brought flowers to place it beneath the window. Some were sure that the image was an absolute miracle. Uh, Digna Feldman brought her 20-month-old grandson to see the image. She said, this is a miracle. I pray for her, that is, the image on the window pane, to protect him uh, and then there was another woman named Tammy Park who said, oh, she's beautiful. This is unbelievable. I would say that's right. It is unbelievable. <laughs> and she brought a daughter and prayed to the, the image on the window pane that uh, God would perform a miracle, that the image on the window pane would perform a miracle and uh, heal her daughter of a disability. Now, Jesus did perform miracles. And no ifs, ands, and buts about that. And why did he do it? Why did Jesus give signs and wonders? Well, he did that to authenticate his ministry. Let me give you a couple of verses to put in your margin. One is Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Now, you don't turn to it. I've copied it out to save us time because I have a lot to say today. Just put it in your margin. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Jesus did signs and wonders. <laughs> you, cannot, uh, you cannot take that out of the word of God, nor should we wish to. 
Well, why did he do signs and wonders? Well, we're in the Gospel of John. If you were to fast forward to John chapter 20 and look in verses 30 and 31, you'd read, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, now listen, listen, listen carefully. These are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, God did miracles to authenticate the ministry of Jesus. But the miracle was not for the miracle's sake. The miracle was that you might believe on Jesus and have eternal life. Not that you might seek a miracle, but a Messiah. Not a sign, but a Savior. Now, it's also clear that the apostles did signs and wonders. Some people think that uh, we ought to do signs and wonders because they were done in the New Testament. But these were the signs and wonders done by the apostles. Put this verse down. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now, the apostle Paul had power to do miracles, signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And God authenticated the ministry of the apostles with signs and wonders. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, put that verse down. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, they did not have uh, the power to do signs and wonders according to their own will, but God took the apostles. And because they were apostles and they were setting the foundation of our faith, God authenticated their ministry with signs and wonders. But folks, that is not the program for the whole age. God has given us something better than signs and wonders, and I want to show that to you. Listen, what is wrong with demanding a sign? What is wrong with what this man first did when Jesus rebuked him and said, except ye see signs and wonders, you'll not believe? As a matter of fact, Jesus said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Now, boy, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty strong. An evil and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Well, why is it so bad? Well, first of all, it's dishonoring to God. Why is it dishonoring to God for you to say, God, give me a sign, give me a wonder so I can believe? Well, we have his word. <laughs> Suppose I come to my son and I say, now, son, I want you to know that I love you and I have deposited $1,000 in the bank for you. It's in your account. I've opened up an account for you it, and I've done that for you. Son, you've got $1,000 in the bank. Suppose he says to me, Dad, how do I know I have $1,000 in the bank? Well, I just told you. Well, Dad, you know, Dad, it, it sure would mean a whole lot to me if you would show me the deposit slip. I mean, if, if somewhere, or you could just take me down there to the bank and let me see it so I would know it. I say, son, I just told you. No, but, but I want a sign. I want to wonder. I want something that I can see. I want something I can touch. I want something I can taste. I want something I can smell. Don't just give me your word. You know, the Bible says, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Now, there was a man named Thomas in the Bible. We call him Doughty Thomas. Jesus was raised from the dead. The apostles were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead according as he had promised in his word. You know what little Thomas said? He said, unless I put my finger in the nail prints and in his side where the wound is, he said, I'll not believe. Now, I want you to go to John 20 and look at it. Look in John 20. Just turn over to it. John 20, verse 29. Jesus appeared to him and said, Okay, Tom, put your hand there. Go ahead. Thrust your hand into my side. And notice in verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Did Thomas get a lot of credit for that? Notice what Jesus said. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. You see, is it, was it good for Thomas to believe after he's had a sign, a wonder, after he's felt with his hands? Well, it was okay. But he missed the blessing of simply believing the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why, why is seeking signs and wonders dangerous? Number one, it dishonors God. Number two, it can be deceiving to you. 
it can be very, very deceiving. Signs and wonders can easily deceive. Joyce and I were talking, we were getting dressed for church about the coming Antichrist. And, uh, uh, and I said, Joyce, I'm going to be speaking about that a little bit uh, this morning. There's coming Satan's Superman who will be the devil incarnate. And do you know what he's going to do to authenticate his ministry? Signs and wonders. And, and the, you know, the, Jesus said, if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Put this verse down, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. It speaks of him, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, now don't miss this, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist will be able to make you think black is white, good is bad, and cut your mother's throat with a smile on your face because of the, the ability that he will have to deceive. With all power and signs and lying wonders. The devil can do signs and lying wonders and will do them uh, through his Antichrist. Let me give you this verse. Speaking of the false prophet who is the sinister minister of propaganda for the Antichrist that is coming, listen to this. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And watch this now and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. The beast now is the Antichrist. Saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and did live. Why, this, this propaganda agent for the Antichrist has the ability to do signs and wonders so that people would literally worship Satan's superman. So signs and wonders, not only to demand signs and wonders, dishonors God, but secondly, it may be very deceptive to you. Why? The, <laughs> it says that he makes fire come down out of heaven. Now what would that be? I don't know. Maybe some dazzling display, maybe an, an atomic explosion in outer space. I don't know what it may be. Uh, I, I, but but uh, suppose... Suppose I say, oh God, I want to know whether or not I am right with you. I want to know whether I'm going to heaven. God, would you give me a sign? Now, I don't just say, Lord, would you move a chair across the room? I say, Lord, would you, <laughs> would you just give me a sign in the heavens? And when I say that, boy, the heavens are ablaze from pole to pole. I see shimmering fire. <laughs> I say, <laughs> I, God and I are tight. Boy, I mean, I've got it made. There's a sign. I have a sign. Now I know the judgment comes. I stand before the Lord. I have never repented of my sin. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never been twice born. And my soul is dropping into hell. And I say, God, how can you do that? You gave me a sign. And the devil says, you fool. You fool. God didn't give you that sign. I'm the one that made fire come down out of heaven to deceive you. The Bible says if it were possible, Satan would deceive the very elect. And don't you let some wonder worker, some miracle worker, some sign giver, some uh, uh, soothsayer, some emissary from Satan deceive you and you go following off after something else because of some sign and some wonder. Jesus said an adulterous and sinful generation seeks after a sign. It is dishonoring to God and it may be very deceptive to man. Now, let's move to the second point. Uh, I, I want you to see not only the, the problem of superficial faith or uh, superstitious faith, but notice the progression of strong faith. I want you to see how this man moved from a weak faith to a very strong, solid, substantive faith. And, and I want to give you the steps because they're progressive steps here. Uh, he, he moves from signs and wonders to the Word. Uh, and uh, let me give you these steps. Step number one, he heard the Word of God. Look, if you will, in, in uh, verse 50. And so Jesus saith unto him, Jesus saith unto him, 
Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word. Number one, he heard the word of God. Now let me tell you what faith is. Faith is not naming it and claiming it. Faith is not receiving from God what you want. Faith is accepting from God what He gives. Hear the Word of God. Uh, notice this man. He's a nobleman. He's, he's, trying, uh, he's trying to tell Jesus uh, what to do. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down. That is, you come with me. Come on, Lord, I'm going to take you to Capernaum. Now notice verse 50. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way. He says, you come, Jesus said, you go. You go. You're not here to tell me what to do. You're not here to demand me. You're not here to command me. You're here to hear me, to listen to me, to get a word from me. Romans 10 verse 14 says this, How then shall they call on him? in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And then Romans 10, verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, folks, if you want strong faith, you've got to hear the word of God. Let me tell you what faith is. Listen to me. Faith is taking God at his word. Did that sink in? Faith is taking God at His Word. The man believed the Word. Jesus said to him, and he heard Jesus. Now, that's, it's very important that if you would have faith, number one, you must know what God has said. And if you want others to have faith, you must tell them what God has said. And that's the reason Paul said, how can they hear without a preacher? This church that is so blessed of God is blessed of God because of this sacred desk, not the man behind it. But from the inception of this church in 1903, this church has been based on the Word of God. The preaching of the Word of God. Not signs, not wonders, not ecstasies, not supposed miracles. We have a lot of churches who, who advertise signs and miracles and wonders. They advertise them and don't do them. Jesus did them and didn't advertise them. The Word of God. Step number one in having a strong faith, number one is to hear the Word of God. Number two is to believe the Word of God. Now look, if you will, in verse, four, in verse 50. And the man believed the Word. Do you see that? Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the Word. That's step number two in faith. It's not enough to hear the Word of God. You can sit here and listen to me preach this morning, but if, if you don't believe the Word of God, you're not going to have faith. You have to believe the Word of God. Well, you say, Adrian, I can't believe. That's my problem. I just can't believe. May I tell you, sir, may I tell you, madam, that you can believe if you want to. The Bible says, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Well, you say, I have intellectual problems. No, you don't. You don't have intellectual problems. Your problem is not intellectual. It is moral. Your problem is not in your head. It is in your heart. You say, well, I know some intellectuals who don't believe the Bible. Well, I know some intellectuals who do. You say, well, I know some foolish people who believe the Bible. I know some foolish people who don't. What we believe is not uh, contrary to reason. It goes beyond reason. Faith is a gift of God, and if a person wants to believe, God will enable that person to believe. And never say to God, God, it is not my fault if I don't believe. The Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. You see, faith is not seeing signs and wonders. You know what faith is? Faith is a response to the character of God. That's, when Jesus, that's why when Jesus came to this earth, He laid aside all of the glory, the splendor, the majesty uh, that He had that was inherently His, but He kept His deity in, in human flesh and He walked in sandal feet. And when we saw Him, there's no form nor comeliness nor beauty that we should desire Him. He didn't come in, in a jewel chariot in a dis dazzling display of glory. He came through the portals of a virgin's womb, born in a smelly stable, uh, worked in a carpenter's shop, but yet there was in Jesus Christ the grace, the glory, the fullness of God that when a man's heart was right, he heard Jesus, he knew that Jesus is speaking with authority and his heart responds to him. Listen, when your heart is right, your heart will respond to the Word of God 
in faith, just like my eye responds to light when my eye is right, and my ear responds to sound when my ear is right, your heart will respond to God when your heart is right, and that heart response is faith. It is not God does miracles, no. When God speaks, speaks through His Word, there's something in you that says that is true. The Holy Spirit of God whispers amen to your heart. That's the reason before I come out here, I get on my knees and pray because I, I'm not, I can only preach truth, but the Holy Spirit of God imparts truth and He will impart it to your heart. You must hear the Word of God. Number two, you must believe the Word of God. Jesus saith unto him, and then it says, and the man believed the Word of God. Now, you're not there yet. Here's the third step. Not only must you hear the Word of God, not only must you believe the Word of God, you must obey the Word of God. Begin now in verse 50 and look at it. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way. Now watch this. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. <laughs> he went his way. And, and as he was now going down and so forth. He does exactly what Jesus tells him to do. This is what the Bible calls the obedience of faith in Romans 16 verse 26. You know what real, real faith is? Real faith is belief with legs on it. Real faith, don't miss that, it is belief with legs on it. James told us in James chapter 2, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. You don't have strong faith if you do not obey the Word of God. You hear the Word of God, you believe the Word of God, and then you obey the Word of God. Had this man still had his superficial, superstitious faith, he would have still been there begging Jesus for a sign, a wonder. But no, he just leaves it with Jesus. He does exactly what Jesus tells him to do, and he believes the Word of God. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting now concerning faith. Uh, after he believes the Word of God, here's the fourth and the final step, which shows he has this strong faith. He is resting in the Word of God. Look, if you will, now in verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour in which he began to amend. Now, don't miss this. And he saith unto them, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in the which Jesus saith unto him, Thy son liveth. Now, the point is this. It has been 24 hours. 24 hours. When did your son get well? Or when did my son get well? Yesterday. At what time? Well, at, at, at about one in the afternoon. And the man said, well, that's just when I was talking to Jesus. That's just when Jesus said to me, go thy way, thy son lives. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you, if you had a son that was 17 miles away and Jesus had said, go thy way, thy son lives, what would you have done? You'd have gone straight home. Most of us would. Straight home. Why? To see. To see. Now, there's about 17 miles. He could have been there and in um, five or eight hours by foot. He had been there two hours by chariot. He's a nobleman. He certainly wouldn't be on his feet. But 24 hours have passed. 24 hours have passed and he's not going home yet. Tell me why. I really don't know why. <laughs> Maybe he's so tired that he's been sitting up by his son's bedside all this time and his son's at the point of death. Now, Jesus says, your son is alive. He says, fine, thank you. He is resting in what our Lord has done, and it, it is what I want to call the rest of faith. Here's a scripture that I copied out for you, Psalm 37, verses 5 through 7. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest! in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, he's not, he's not demanding proof. He's not even hot-footing at home to see if it, if it has happened. The rest of faith is the mark of real faith, of real faith. You know, he says he's going to bring forth your righteousness as the noonday. Have you ever thought about that? And the Lord says, you just rest in me. It's just like the sun coming up. <laughs> friend, you can't hurry the sunrise, but you can't stop it. And you can't hurry God and you can't, you can't stop him. The Bible says, He that believes in him shall not make haste. 
And here's this man, he's just, he has gone from a superficial faith to a strong faith. He hears the Word of God, he believes the Word of God, he obeys the Word of God, he rests in the Word of God. And if you don't learn how to do that, you listen to your pastor now, you're going to be blown about, you're going to be stampeded by all kinds of things. You get a bulldog grip on the Word of God and don't be trying to live by emotions and feelings and visions and dreams, signs and wonders. They had their purpose. Now, if I get sick or I have a loved one that's sick, can I pray and ask God to heal that loved one? Of course. Of course. And does God heal and answer to prayer? Of course. Could that be a sign and wonder? Of course. But it's not something that causes me to believe in Him. God doesn't always heal the sick. I, I come to Him and I ask Him and, and I thank God that He heals and I believe He has healed me. Is it wrong to go to a doctor? Not at all. Jesus said in Matthew 9 verse 12, uh, they that are sick, uh, they that are whole don't need a doctor, but they that are sick. Well, you say he's talking about spiritual things. Yeah, but he used the truth to illustrate spiritual things with. He wouldn't have illustrated spiritual things with a lie. <laughs> Jesus said sick people need a doctor. So what do you do if you get sick? You pray and then you go to the doctor and, and, uh, and do what the doctor tells you to do. Now, here's the last thing, and, and, and we've really got to hurry here. I want you to see now the provision of saving faith. We talked about superficial faith, strong faith, and now it moves to saving faith. Look in verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Well, wait a minute. I thought he already believed. <laughs> well, no, this is a different kind. He's moving up another notch. The man believes now, not in a miracle worker, but in a Messiah. This time, the man is born again. He believes in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Can you imagine him getting home? What a time of rejoicing there must have been as they hug. He sees his son, he's well, and so forth. And then this man says, now, wait a minute. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the Messiah. And, uh, and, uh, and they come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what the Gospel of John is written about. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you might have life through His name. Jesus did not come as a healer. Jesus came as a Savior. Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And, and so He didn't heal everybody. He, he went to the pool of Bethesda. There were many sick people there. He just healed one, as we're going to see in another chapter. No, all of these are miracles that point to the greater miracle, which is the new birth. I wrote a book called Believe in Miracles, but Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Don't put your faith in miracles. The only reason for signs and miracles and wonders are, are, to, are to trust in Jesus. Now, suppose, suppose this boy had gotten healed and he never got saved. Think about it. Suppose he got healed and he never got saved. Then he'd live a few more years and die and go to hell. That's the reason so many people are, they're seeking the wrong thing. They're seeking a sign, a wonder, a miracle, rather than seeking Jesus, the Messiah. Listen. You hear the Word of God, you believe the Word of God, you obey the Word of God, and you rest in the Word of God. And folks, whatever else God does, you can be certain. I'm going to read something to you, and somebody sent me this. It's one of the most moving things that I've ever read. A lady sent it to me. It was written by her father who was sick. I want you to listen to it. It is very pertinent. Forgive me for reading it, but I don't want to miss a word. Here's what it is called, Why I Follow Christ. I received this several years ago. This person said, I have not seen clear statistical evidence that fewer Christians die of cancer than non-believers or that they are immune in greater degree from the diseases that afflict the human race. Some of the kindest, most selfless persons I have known have had more than their share of bad health. The fact that they belong to Christ did not insulate them from disease. Therefore, I will not follow Christ for promised healing. I will not deny or dispute evidence of restoration of health. I will rejoice at every recovery from what seems to be hopeless, threatened death. I will not hesitate to pray for recovered health for my loved ones and acquaintances. I will set no limits on what God may do, but I will not follow Christ 
for promised healing. I see no sign that Christians escape disaster and accident more often than others. I have helped dear friends empty muddy water out of dresser drawers and new appliances after a disastrous flood. I remember as a child taking clothes to a widow with five children whose house had burned to the ground. A bullet makes no detour around the body of a believer. Therefore, I will not follow Christ for any promised protection from disaster. I will not scoff at amazing survivals nor deny that providence has and continues to work for the good of God's own. I will continue to pray for protection from wicked men and tragedy, but I will not follow Christ for promised protection from accident or catastrophe. I do not observe that Christians are especially favored with prosperity. Like James, we have all seen the rich oppressing the poor. And justice is rarely perfect in this world. The psalmist has said that he had not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And in the deepest needs of life, that is certainly true. But all of us have known people of integrity who have not prospered. Therefore, I will not follow Christ for promised freedom from physical want or the hope of affluence. I am not sure that Christians have stronger personalities or fewer neuroses than non-believers. I do know that there is no bitterness like religious bitterness and no arrogance more insufferable. I have watched Christians suffer emotional and mental disabilities. And though it may seem heretical, I'm not sure that I would really enjoy living in the same house with either the Apostle Peter or Paul. That's interesting. God wills that the mind of Christ be formed in us. And there's no doubt in my mind that the Christian's attitudes and actions will be improved by his Christianity. But I will not follow Christ for any promise of personality enhancement or, perfe or perfection. Now listen to this. Why then follow Christ? Why become a disciple of Jesus when life may become more complicated as he so often warned? For one reason alone. In Jesus, we behold the face of God. He is the truth, the everlasting truth, God in the flesh. I know that in his life, death, and resurrection, I am reconciled to God, the giver of life. I believe that nothing can separate me from the love of God. He has all power and goodness. I trust in him and his promises. To him, I offer my life, damaged our whole, brief, are full of years. It matters not. He is the one certain thing in an uncertain world. He is to be worshiped, not so something will happen to me or to the world. Something already has happened to me in the world, but because he is God who through Christ has reconciled the world to himself. He saves me. He is my justification. He is the center that holds. To worship the God of our salvation, to offer sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. That alone is our vocation. We offer our lives to God, not so as to be healthy, wealthy, or wise, not even so as to gain strength to do great things for Him. We offer our lives to Him because He alone has claim upon us. Boy, is that not great? Is that not great? Don't be looking for some sign, some wonder, some miracle that's going to get you out. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the Savior. He suffered, lived, uh, bled, and died for you, rose from the dead. And if you'll trust him, I promise you, according to his word, he will save you and he will keep you. And one day we'll be gathered around the throne to give him praise forever and ever and ever. Believe in miracles, but trust in Jesus. And you go from a superficial faith to a strong faith to a saving faith. That's what matters. Bow your heads in prayer. Father God, I pray today in the name of Jesus that many will give their hearts to Christ and be saved. If you want to be saved, I want to guide you in a prayer. I want you to pray this prayer. Dear God, just pray it. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. My sin deserves judgment, but I need mercy. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from my sin. Lord Jesus, I open my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive my sin, cleanse me, and save me right now. 
I don't ask for a feeling. I don't look for a sign. I believe your word. I stand on your word. I trust you to save me. Thank you for doing it, Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, I will obey your word and make it public. I will not be ashamed of you. Give me the courage to do it this morning. Amen. Friend, may I say another word to those of you who are watching? If you would like to do what these are doing this morning in our worship center, I invite you to pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. I need to be saved and I want to be saved. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Lord Jesus. Now, you don't have to remember all of those words. You can just pray, save me, Lord Jesus. And if you've done that, would you write to us and let us know? And we'll send you some literature to help you get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you as we explore these fundamentals of the Christian faith with Adrian Rogers. You can stream this message again and download Pastor Rogers' outlines and notes on this message all at lwf.org or the My LWF app. While you're there, be sure to check out our new Bible studies on these same topics, as well as Pastor Rogers' audio series, Back to the Basics, also available at lwf.org. At lwf.org, you can also sign up to receive our daily heartbeat email, which includes a written devotional and a 90-second inspirational audio clip, both from Adrian Rogers, as well as a link to our daily radio program delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. And don't forget, you can catch up with our program each week on our Facebook page or YouTube channel or on the My LWF app. Thanks for joining us for our program today. We'll see you next time. Jesus, the name literally means Jehovah saves. That baby born in Bethlehem was the mighty God of Genesis 1-1. There are names God gives us for himself, names that spirit-inspired writers called him, and symbolic names used to describe him in scripture. This Christmas, we've made 25 of these names and their meanings into beautifully illustrated ornaments for you to display. Each ornament reveals insight into a name of God given to us in Scripture and shares what that name says about His character. The Names of God ornament set also includes an Advent devotional booklet that shares thoughts on each name. For your gift this month, we'd like to send you the Names of God ornament set. Request yours when you call 1-800-647-9400 or you can give online at lwf.org.